Thank you, Dr. Connick. And, and thank you, Dr. Fine. Uh, it's great to be back uh, in this room. I remember when it first opened, which was great. In fact, I gave my first grand rounds here in the Department of Lab Medicine 35 years ago. It was uh, the um, uh, detection of myocardial infarction using CKMB. And uh, my mentors were Kathy Clayson and Paul Strangard on that. So it was, it was fantastic. Um, uh, the topic I have today is not quite as fun, but it is even more exciting than diagnosing heart attacks. So uh, we're here to talk about FDA's initiative to regulate lab-developed tests, LTDs, and my conclusion is it's going to harm patients and uh, academic pathology. So uh, we'll first start with the obligatory disclosures. I am on a professor's salary from the U of U. I have administrative duties as University Associate Vice President for Government Relations for ARUP. I don't have to worry about the rest of the U of U, just the ARUP relationships. My clinical duties include directing maternal serum screening for ARUP. And just so you know, ARUP is a not-for-profit enterprise of the U. There's no private ownership. Uh, I'm a 1982 resident graduate of, of uh, this department, which I am very proud of. By the way, do you know how I got stolen away? You let Utah come and do a cap inspection of my lab at Harborview. <laughs> that, that's, that's how it happened. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so Dr. Knight and Dr. Hill had something to do with uh, stealing me down to Salt Lake City. Okay, uh, here are the, the objectives for today's presentation. I want you, after you leave, to understand the history and current regulatory process of clinical lab tests. Uh, the lab developed tests as they're regulated currently under CMS and CLIA, and medical devices as they are regulated under the FDA. I'd like you to explain the negative impact of dual regulation on patient care uh, and also on competition. Uh, the current proposal, if fully enacted, could create quite a few monopolies, so keep that in mind and think about what monopolies do to the cost of, of medical care. And then finally, if I can get you real excited, I'd like you to act uh, to prevent or mitigate the FDA's intent to regulate lab developed tests. So for the last 30 years, people have been saying that laboratory medicine was going to die. We actually could die if the FDA got its way, so pay attention. Let's start with some definitions. Uh, La what are LTDs? What are lab-developed tests? These are clinical tests offered by labs that do not use FDA-approved kits, instruments, or reagents, but it also includes an important category of FDA-approved kits if you use them off-label. So the FDA considers the use of an off, the off-label use of a test, used not for its intended use, as a lab-developed test. I do material serum screening, so I have four tests in the quad test, AFP, HCG, estriol, and inhibin. Guess what? None of them are on the intended use. So my whole career I've been doing maternal serum screening and all the 1.4 million women I've screened have been entirely off-label use, which would mean that if this goes through, we will have to be beholden to the FDA to review submissions on those uses and seek their approvals. Okay, let's go back and look at history. I always think that it's good to look at history because it tells us where we've been and maybe we know where we're going. So this is the preface of a textbook. And uh, this book aims to present clear and concise statement of the more valuable laboratory methods that have clinical value. Well, that sounds really good. And a brief guide to interpretation of the results. That's good too. It's designed for the student and practitioner, not the trained laboratory worker. Sorry, Joanne, it's not for you. Um, it had its origin some years ago as a set of, sh of notes which the author dictated to his classes, and it's gradually grown by the addition each year of uh, such matter as the year's teaching suggested. The eagerness and care with which the students and some practitioners took to these notes and used them convinced the writer of the need uh, 
for a volume of this scope. Now, who would like, please humor me, what year was this written? Try to come within 10 years of when this was written. 1950, okay, that's a good guess, but not right. And nobody's come within 10 years yet. This was written by James Campbell Todd at the, the University of Colorado in 1908. <laughs> the, the year our specialty was founded, right? Because he sort of started it all, Todd and Sanford. And it's now in its 20th Second edition, 2011. But if you want a really good chemistry book, you'll buy Teats instead of Henry. So um, anyway, uh, I guess all I'm saying is, is that lab developed tests, you know, start, I mean, lab medicine, clinical pathology started with lab developed tests and it started with people like James Campbell Todd uh, doing them. Next, you'll have to humor me a bit because I'm going to show you a list of tests and I'd like you to tell me what this list has in common. Metanephrines, fluorescence polarization of amniotic fluid. Ooh, that one's for Dr. Tate. Uh, lamellar body counts in amniotic fluid. Alkaline phosphatase isoenzymes. Arsenic by ICP mass spec. We could go on and on, but what do these have in common? Well, they're all lab-developed tests that I have been responsible for reviewing and signing out and, and conducting. And of course, it's a small list because half the tests on ARUP's menu are lab-developed tests. So let's turn now to the history of the FDA. And at least you think I, that I believe the FDA is some sort of evil bureaucratic empire. I don't. The F FDA has a great mission, and I want to share that with you. So it was founded in 1906, the Pure Food and Drugs Act. OK, so it does predate our specialty by two years. I'll give them credit for that. Um, it got a major boost in 1938. The, food, the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act got passed. And it got passed because this antibiotic was compounded by a company using diethylene glycol. They had done no animal studies on it at all. It was given to many patients, and lots of kids died. Most of these 100 deaths caused by this uh, uh, antibiotic uh, compounding were children. And, and you might imagine why. This is like giving antifreeze to kids. So that really got Congress to act, and they passed this, and, and uh, they wanted food, drugs, and cosmetics to be safe. OK, fast forward to 1976. The medical device amendments were enacted in 1976. And they were enacted uh, after a long period, six years of debate, the, the HEW Cooper Committee had been recommending a new medical device regulations based on risk of the medical device. But the one that got the law passed was this device. Do you know what that is? Dalcon That's a Dal Dalcon Shield. And so that really harmed a lot of patients and got Congress uh, excited enough to take this issue, pass a law, and uh, really expand the powers of the FDA. Now, this is the law that the FDA claims gives them the authority to regulate lab-developed tests. That law never mentions clinical labs. It's not in the law. And I've talked to people who helped get this law passed, and they said they never had any conception that it would regulate laboratory-developed tests. Lab tests were off the table with this, but that is the law that the FDA quotes and the FDA attorneys say um, is at the, the root of this issue. Okay, so the issue. So FDA has authority to regulate lab developed tests starting 1976. Until 1992, they completely ignore it. Lab developed tests are entirely ignored. That's great because a lot of my early years were spent bringing on lots of tests during that time and I didn't have to worry about the FDA. My blood, my blood banking colleagues did, but I didn't have to. In 1992, they changed their stance on lab developed tests. They said, oh, well, we have the authority to regulate them, but we're going to ignore it. We're going to exercise something we call enforcement discretion. That's like the police officer allowing you to speed on I-5, if that were possible at all these days. <laughs> <laughs> and in 
and uh, uh, in, under their discretion, not pull you over and give you a ticket. <laughs> and so that was the FDA stance. But in 2010, they decided to change that. So in June of 2010, they announced their intent to regulate lab-developed tests. They held a public meeting. Many of us attended. There must have been about 500 people at this meeting. And uh, by and large, the majority voice, not majority, the, the super majority voice from the labs was, don't do this. It's a bad idea. What followed were many meetings with the FDA, Congress, the Office of Management and Budget, which is uh, part of the executive branch. They oversee uh, guidances and, um, and regulations and decide if, if they're written well and should be implemented. Um, and in fact, it, it's so funny, I'll back up here just a little bit, because the FDA said in June of 2010, before Thanksgiving, you'll have this guidance in your hands. We can't show you a copy right now, but by Thanksgiving of 2010, you'll have a copy of this in your hands, and you'll be able to see that you'll like some things about it, and you'll ha hate some things about it. Well, we all knew that we were going to hate it regardless, so uh, we managed to delay uh, the implementation of the guidance for four years. And uh, finally, in July of 2014, FDA notified Congress that they were going to uh, regulate LTDs with a guidance. And then in October, they published that guidance. Of course, we had access to it in July because when they give it to Congress, it has to become public. And so we could read it and, and get ready for uh, mounting our arguments against it. And then in, in January of uh, this year, they held a public workshop at uh, the FDA campus, and uh, about 250 folks attended, and, and about 60 people got to testify. Uh, the draft guidance comment period was extended uh, for four months. Usually, they only give guidances three months uh, for comments, and that they extended this one to, to February 2nd. And they closed the comment period with about 236 comments filed. And then the FDA right now is reviewing all of those comments and preparing written responses on all of them. And we're just waiting for them to, to act. Well, that's not completely true, but, but we do await their action. So that's the issue. So here are the arguments the FDA gives for this new guidance. They say that lab-developed tests are more complicated than in 1976. Okay, yeah, I think that technology has advanced. Some lab-developed tests are unsafe. That's true, there's frauds committed by all sorts of companies against people, and some of those have been lab tests. Lab-developed tests have not been proven effective, well, at least not proven to the FDA. I mean, obviously, what do we do when we write papers about lab tests? We're trying to prove whether they work or not. So I think if you look at the peer review li literature, you'd find that uh, many of them have been proven effective. But the, the real important issue here is that the FDA truly believes in its heart of hearts. They have the authority to regulate. And if you're a government official and your centers are so big, but there's all this enforcement discretion you have and you wanna make your center even bigger, then you wanna go regulate even more. Here's the prim primary argument against uh, more regulation. Lab-developed tests are services. Uh, they are not medical devices. They weren't even mentioned in the act. They're more akin to the practice of medicine than they are uh, manufacturing a device to be used in a, in a thousand different labs. Therefore, FDA has no authority over LTDs. So that's, that's a good argument. It's got about a 50-50 chance of winning in court. Um, the other arguments against LTDs uh, regulated by the draft guidance is that it would be expensive, it would establish monopolies, it would slow innovation of new LTDs. Every year, ARUP brings on between 80 and 100 new tests, and we would be diverted away from doing that to trying to get submissions on the current menu, and so we'd have to take the resource from someplace and we'd take it from R&D, and so obviously, new test development would slow down. Also, and very importantly, I think, it stifles the improvement of old tests. Um, during my career, I signed out 100,000 HIV Western blots. That's an FDA-approved product, and it hasn't changed in 20 years, and it needs improvement. But there's no willpower to change it. 
there's no economic incentive for the company that sells the reagents to go back to an, with a new submission to FDA. So you end up with obsolete products on the market, which I think can harm patients. It clearly, though, protects manufacturers. Manufacturers see this as a big win. In fact, we've been fighting them hard because they've been putting their lobby money to folks who will support their position that uh, lab-developed tests need to be regulated. Okay, now, if the FDA wins and they regulate lab-developed tests, then how do they regulate them? They can't just invent new rules. They have to regulate them under the law that's passed, which says that a test has to be safe and, and uh, effective. Actually, it says a device has, has to be safe and effective. I have a hard time imagining unsafe tests. It's the things we do to patients after we get the test that is unsafe but the test itself isn't unsafe. Uh, the manufacturer's claims of intended use have to be paid attention to. And this is very insidious because I, I'll bet half the FDA-approved tests that are used in America today are used off-label. And then finally, the FDA looks at the quality of the design, which probably is a very useful thing. It'd be nice if somebody looked at whether a test is designed well. And the manufacturing process. Well, manufacturing process makes sense for companies that are shipping kits to lots and lots of places to have those kits be used, but it makes less sense for one lab who is doing a handcrafted test by themselves. You don't really manufacture it. You don't really label it and put it in a box and then ship it across the country. You keep it at home. They also have to classify devices into three categories, and there's these three classes are class one, two, and three, low, moderate, and high risk. We'll go through those uh, device classifications. Low risk, and this is currently, this is currently how they're treating the manufacturers. Low risk devices are exempt from pre-market submission. You have to manufacture them though under good manufacturing practices, which are different than being cap accredited or doing following good laboratory practices. So this is a different set of requirements. Uh, and you have to list the, the uh, you have to notice up to the FDA that you're doing this device and you have to list it with them. And in fact, the Theranos nanotainer is a listed device right now, if you guys want to know where the nanotainer stands. Class two is a moderate risk device. A lot of laboratory tests fall into this category and uh, in this category, FDA clears the device for use. And generally, there's a predicate device. So you, you're coming with a Me Too device, you're comparing it to an existing device, you're showing that it's a substantially equivalent, and you do that with a 510K submission, and you do that before you sell it, pre-market notification. FDA promises a 90-day review clock, but the true average is a 121 days, and they game the system. What they do is you submit, then they take all their time up to 90 days to review it, and then they re at day 89 they reject it, and the clock starts over. So if you, if you actually look at how long it takes to get a 510K through, it's, it's nowhere close to 90 days, and it's nowhere close to 121 days. For many things, it's several years. They get about 3,500 applications a year. They approve about 95%. 5% of them they don't approve. And then class three is the highest risk of device. Uh, this requires a pre-market approval. The fee just to do this is a quarter million dollars. So you send them a pallet of information to review as well as a quarter of a megabuck to, uh, to get the review done. They have 180 days to review it, but the true average is greater than a year. They did the BRAF really fast. We'll get to that later in the, in the presentation. They only do 35 a year, and there's an 80% approval chance for a PMA. Only 35. I mean, ARUP brings 80 new tests a year. That's one company bringing 80 new tests a year to, to the market. So, I mean, let's hope that high risk is very rare, but Actually, it's not. If you look at the FDA definition, uh, it's going to be quite a few tests. Okay, switching uh, gears away from FDA and going to CLIA. 
what's the CLIA paradigm? So CLIA got passed in 67 and then was upgraded in 1988. And it was comprehensive legislation uh, that directed the Health and Human Services to regulate labs under a single law. Because labs, the, the laws regulating labs up to then had been very piecemeal, had been scattered all about. And in fact, Rep Representative John Dingell, a Democrat from Michigan, whose term just recently ended, I think he was in the House for 50 years, um, his quote said that CLIA should end the duplicative and confused regulation under a tangled web of statutory authorities. That's music to my ears. Let's, I mean, it's embracing CMS, but let's regulate under CMS. Wouldn't that be good? One, one regulatory body, not two for labs like ours. And interesting enough, the FDA did not comment about this legislation. They just let it go through. Even though they're claiming that enforcement discretion has been exercised since 1976. Okay, I know this is a busy slide, but if you just look at the red part, this is what CLIA says you have to do to verify that an FDA cleared or approved test is used in your lab. Accuracy, precision, reportable range. We all do it, it's easy. It doesn't mean that it works well. Dr. Chandler was telling me about a very lousy test uh, this afternoon, this FDA approved, but doesn't work. Uh, here's what CLIA says about non-FDA approved. So you have to establish the performance specifications of these non-approved tests. And these could be methods developed in-house or standardized methods out of textbooks. Ooh, I like that since I have a textbook. Um, but for each, uh, each one, you've got to establish a longer list of, of, of performance specifications. So accuracy and precision, just like the FDA approved ones, but also analytical sensitivity, which I assume could mean how low can you go, what's your uh, lowest detectable amount. Uh, analytical specificity, which I interpret as mean interfering substances, what, what interferes with the test, what doesn't. The reportable range of test results uh, for the test system and the, the reference intervals uh, for, um, uh, for your populations. Also, CLIA includes this last point seven, any other performance characteristic required for the test performance, and that's under the judgment of the lab director. So I think that all lab directors should be thoughtful and should think about clinical validity. Is this clinically valid? And if, if it is, then actually the current law covers everything, analytical validity, clinical validity. Um, unfortunately, it's not going to stay status quo. Sorry, I wish it could, but it's not. This is just the front page of the uh, draft guidance that got issued uh, last October 3rd. There were two guidances, but uh, this is the main one, and uh, it lays forth uh, what the FDA intends to do. And um, so some of the scary things is, guess what? We're not clinical laboratories. We're manufacturers. The FDA declares that we're a manufacturer and we're beholden to all the uh, oversight that an IVD company is. So that's a bit scary. Uh, Pre-market review and approval for class two and class three lab developed tests are required. There are some exceptions, which I'll show you in a moment. Quality system regulation requirements would be enacted. If you wanna know what those are, go spend some time in the blood bank and you'll find that out. Medical device reporting of adverse events, same thing. If you kill somebody, you've gotta report it to them. And then there are exceptions. Uh, but they're qu quite confusing. So the first exception in the draft guidance is traditional lab developed tests. So what does that mean? Does that mean traditional as of 1992 or does it mean traditional as of 1976? Um, so if it means traditional as of 1976, then we're talking about no mass spec tests, no HPLC, no ELISA, no PCR, uh, no DNA based tests. So, I mean, wow, that wipes out most of the menu right there. Um, and these traditional LTDs have to be manufactured and used by a healthcare facility laboratory for a patient's being diagnosed at the same healthcare facility. So if you have any outreach at all, you don't qualify under the traditional LTD uh, exemption. And then finally, 
they threw this one in, comprised only of components legally marketed for clinical use. That means there's no research use only. Well, I run PAP-A on my integrated test. It's an RUO, done it on, on many thousands of women, and it's a, a very vital test, but obviously I wouldn't be, it wouldn't qualify under the traditional LTD. And then finally, without the use of software for interpretation. Now, who still uses graph paper to construct a calibration curve? I'm sorry, it's just, um, uh, it, it makes no sense. Here are the other exceptions uh, that are in the guidance. Unmet needs, so if you have a lab test that is meeting an unmet need, then it's fine, it'll be exempted. But you better watch out because if one gets approved, then it's no longer an unmet need and you'll have to submit your LTD to the FDA. Uh, LTDs for rare diseases and their definition is just so bizarre. Fewer than 4,000 patients that are tested for the disease in the USA. So, you know, there's not 4,000 kids with PKU, but we test all the newborns for PKU. So there's lots of rare diseases where we do thousands of tests and they obviously don't want them to be accepted. They, they want to be able to review them. Finally, LTDs for forensics, LTDs uh, for HLAs. I don't know how Malik Kamun did this, but he, somehow he got an HLA exception, <laughs> which I guess is terrific for them, but hard for us. Malik was my chief resident when I was here as a first year resident, for those of you that don't know. Okay. Um, so here's one of the FDA slides that they've used in many of their talks, and they're showing how the continued enforcement discretion is gonna be so useful to us all. Forensic, well, we don't do any of that. HLA, well, we do a little of that, so that, that's useful. Uh, low risk, rare diseases, traditional and unmet needs, except you're going to, in six months after enactment of the final guidance, you're gonna to have to notify and do medical device reporting. Uh, to them. So they're not completely exempting it. You've got to do notification and reporting. And then for your high risk and moderate risk tests, uh, within six months, you've got to notify them that you're doing high risk tests and start medical device reporting of adverse events. Uh, and then within a year, you're going to have to get your pre-market submission in. Now, they, they might take longer than a year to review it, uh, but um, uh, that's because they get to sort of break the rules. Uh, the, um, if there's a current test out there that is FDA approved and your LTD competes with it and it's in high risk by FDA's definition, then you fall into that highest risk category. Uh, the uh, moderate tests kick in at five years and all the other high risk that don't have competing products kick in between two years and five years. Anyway, there's about a nine year rollout in the draft guidance of submissions, reviews, and approvals. So um, pre-market review for new ones, while, while that nine year period is happening, any new lab developed test that you come up with that has the same intended use as a current product has to be submitted before you can offer it. Uh, if it has the same intended use as is any high risk class three medical device right now. Uh, and also they, they carved out all of the uh, blood product testing tests. Uh, those all have to be reviewed as well. So we took a look at the guidance and we decided, okay, well let's make, let's marshal some arguments. Let's have economic arguments and patient harm arguments. We're gonna walk through the economic harm first. So class twos require a 510K, class threes require PMAs. We know the review is gonna be slow and the cost of preparing the submission is going to be very high. And we went to our business school and we asked them to do some estimates of what those costs might be. And uh, here are the costs. So orient you to this graph. The vertical axis shows submission complexity and is kind of measured in dollars. And the horizontal axis shows years to approval, measured in years. So 510Ks are taking between 50 
thousand dollars to a quarter million dollars and are taking between one and one and a half years. So that's where your moderate risk tests go. Your high risk tests, your PMA submissions, are costing between two and a half and five million, and that's a bit conservative because I know Roche spent 18 million on their BRAF. So, uh, and remember that the fee alone is a quarter million dollars just to ask the FDA to review this. And it's taking between two and a half and three and a half years. So those are the costs. Let's go to our database and let's see what it's gonna cost ARUP. So we took one of our senior scientists and gave her this wonderful task of going through the whole menu and saying, is it a class two or a class three lab developed tests? And we asked all of the medical directors at ARUP to give us their opinion as to what, what level their uh, lab developed test was. And that was a bit of a mistake because the guy that hired me, Harry Hill, declared all of his immunology tests class one. <laughs> and I said, nice try, Harry, but it doesn't quite work that way. Uh, we came up with more than 500 class twos and more than 60 class threes that are on ARUP's menu. We then modeled what it would cost to take all of these through the FDA. What would be the cost of the pre-market approval alone? Just getting that piece done. Yes, a third of a billion dollars to get our current menu through the FDA. Now, I don't think there was a third of a billion dollars worth of benefit coming back to the patients that we're testing, but that's what it would cost. Now, of course, this isn't practical. We, uh, AREP's good, but we don't have that much cash in the bank. So what would we do? We would test by test decide which test should we keep and submit and which test would we abandon. And again, uh, one of our uh, uh, junior faculty modeled this mathematically. He's great, he's a former business professor, so he really no understands how to do these things. And uh, uh, we modeled it and decided that there's about 400 lab developed tests that we would just walk away from. It's about 15% of our revenue we would abandon. Some of these tests would become extinct. Some of them would become send outs to other labs. And uh, some would be replaced with inferior FDA products. You know, when there's an FDA product, we use it. We embrace it, unless it's no good. If we, try to, if we evaluate it's no good, then we're not going to put it on the menu. So, um, uh, but we might be forced to put it on the menu if it was the only option. And the interesting thing is that other labs will look at this and draw the same conclusions. If you have some lab developed tests, you're gonna have to decide what is it gonna cost us to get the submission. Ooh, Dr. Fine, can we have $250,000 to get this test that's making us $4,000 a year? W will you fund that one? Yeah, sure, right. Uh, no, it'll become a sent out. If it, it exists at all, so it really creates this huge monopoly. So uh, we think that the guidance as written, if enacted, would increase the cost of the patients. And we think the costs are real and somebody's got to bear them. And uh, I know that lab medicine is hugely profitable, but I don't know if it can bear all that cost and still have a viable business at the, at the end. I've talked a little bit about the hindered innovation. So it's not only new test development that's going to be slowed down, but old test improvement is just going to get stifled. It's going to clearly create monopolies and reduce competition. Now, how many of you believe that reduced competition uh, lowers prices? You know, it does exactly the opposite, right? Look at the drugs. Look at culture scene. It used to cost 10 cents. Now it costs $10. Why? Not because somebody invented anything. Somebody took it through the FDA and got it approved. And once it's approved, then it's a monopoly. And then once it's a monopoly, then they jack the price up. OK, so that's the economic argument. It's not all about money, right? We're not all about money. We're about patient care. We're, we're laboratorians. We practice laboratory medicine. We, lo we want to keep patients safe. Will they be safer? You know. Many LTDs exist because they're better than the obsolete FDA-approved tests. Uh, here's, here's some examples. BRAF, and BRAF, by the way, is one of the major tests that's driving the in vitro diagnostics companies to push for regulation of our industry. 
um, they got a big black eye on this one. Uh, they have the drug that uh, is a miracle drug for people that have a, a V600 mutation. I mean, the tumors just melt away. Now, maybe it's not permanent, but it is dramatic response in these people who have these tumors. And so they spent all this time and money developing and validating and getting FDA approval for their test, and their test is lousy. They only got 40% of the market. And why? Because it's not very good. It's not even a next-gen sequencing test. So it misses some treatable mutations. In fact, if you were going to really use their test, you'd use it, and if it was negative for a mutation, then you'd do a lab develop test right away to see if maybe there was another mutation that you could treat with. And Roche's own public admission says that the LTDs on the market are better than their approved test. But they were angry that it didn't take clinical labs as much resource to get their test onto the market as it took them to get the inferior FDA-approved test onto the market. Whole blood lead. 50% of the labs on whole blood lead use lab-developed tests because the FDA cleared ones or approved ones don't work very well. The ESA lead care was recalled for inaccurate results. It couldn't measure below 10. Do you know what the median value of a blood lead is today? It's about one. So they can't even measure the reference population, the, the, the normal population uh, with, with this device. And the LTD methods have always performed better in, in, the, in the CAP proficiency surveys. Uh, the next example I'd like to present is so amazing. So hepatitis C, discovered in 89, a lab developed test for hepatitis C RNA was developed quickly. I know because I had a master's graduate student working on the project and, and David Hillier and I were, were overseeing what Susan was doing and she developed a very nice nested RT-PCR test that worked great until the lab got con contaminated and we had to switch methods to one that was more protected. But for, for three years, this thing worked really well. It gave you HIV or a HCV RNA viral loads beautifully. And it was 10 years before there was an FDA-approved product on the market uh, for, for uh, viral load testing in hepatitis C. Uh, we bought a sequencer, a DNA sequencer, because Karen Carroll said, I think we need one. We said, well, what should we do with it? She said, I think we should do hepatitis C genotyping. And so we did. The GI people said, well, it's a fun research project, but you don't need it clinically. Well, we had the test online, and then there was this big NIH conference, and guess what? If you were genotype 1, you were a lot different in response to therapy than type 2 or type 3. And so rapidly, that ARUB test doubled every month for 10 months. And if anybody of you know about geometric progression, that means that it, it went from last place to first place in 10 months. And it stayed in first place for a long time. In fact, hepatitis C genotype has actually gone up three times. We're in the third wave of hepatitis genotype testing um, at ARUP. It's been a fantastic test for us. So Abbott approached David Hilliard to evaluate their FDA-approved genotype test. And so we compared sequencing, which is what we do, uh, high-resolution sequencing for, for some cases, uh, to the FDA's approved test. And they jointly wrote a paper. And in the paper, the Abbott scientists include the comment that you really do need these lab developed tests to help you figure out the missed calls that they have with their FDA approved test. It's just, I mean, clear, clear patient harm. Uh, we, we've got to not stifle tests like, like hepatitis C genotyping. Okay, now we're to the last objective and the last objective is action. So we're giving this talk today not to give you medical education, but to encourage you to act. And I'm going to talk about some of the actions we've already done. So the first one is, of course, go talk to the FDA. Convince them that the guidance is unwise. Please do that. It's not likely to succeed, but try. When that fails, then you have three other options. Go to the courts. So sue the FDA. Now, they've only lost one suit on jurisdiction over the course of their whole history, but it would be fun to try. <laughs> to be the second. 
Go to the executive branch of the government. Convince the OMB that the economic impact is too high. That's one of the things the OMB looks at is economic impact to the country. And then finally, work with Congress to pass a law that clearly defines how lab-developed tests should be regulated. At least a law that has the word lab test in it would be nice, uh, regardless of whether it's CMS or FDA. Okay, so here's the actions we've taken. Uh, and so we tried hard to convince the FDA, and in November of 2012, Frank Cockrell and I met with Maggie Homburg at the FDA, and we met with a whole hour. We were allowed to bring no one but ourselves. She had 10 people there. And we spent an hour discussing lab-developed tests, the pros and the cons, the patient harm, the economic impact. And Maggie was very engaged. We, we could tell that just like you guys, naughty, nobody asleep, you know? I mean, they were just really, she got it. And we thought we had made a huge impact. And then we got up to leave and we're doing the handshakes and discussing how we need to talk. And she comes up and the commissioner shakes our hands and says, I do hope that we'll find a resolution that allows you to continue to sell reagents to your customers. <laughs> I mean, Frank and I looked at each other and we realized we had just wasted a trip to DC. <laughs> and, uh, it, uh, and she's a physician. Okay. Uh, in June of 2013, ACLA, the Association of the American Clinical Lab Association, which I'm a member, uh, filed a citizen's petition challenging the FDA's authority. If you think that a government entity is overstepping their bounds, you can file a petition, and they have to answer it. And they waited a little over a year, and then they denied it. And they denied it with just a single, we deny your position, which meant that they didn't believe. It was well written, and I have a link here, uh, which we'll pass around for anybody who's interested in, in reading the citizen petition. Very well written. Right on point. Okay, from um, uh, the other thing we can do is comment on the guidance. So they've accepted all of these comments on the guidance that's out there. They haven't responded to them yet. There were 236 comments submitted. Um, and they also held a public workshop. And uh, uh, th at this public workshop, about 90% of the folks attending were opposed to uh, their, their guidance and this increased regulation. And if, if you're really interested, you can go to this website. My four minute speech starts at one hour, seven minutes and 40 seconds. And I would actually show it to you. We actually have it queued up today. Uh, but uh, let's see, it's right here. This is sort of where I yell at them, Sorry, but it's four minutes long, so we don't have comment. time, so I'm not going to do it. So we'll, we'll stop it. Uh, but if you really want four minutes of great entertainment and angry statesmen, which is what I was trying to do, uh, then, then please go take a peek at that. Okay. Uh, by the way, I got a standing ovation. It was great. It was just like, wow, I can't believe it. A pathologist gets a standing ovation. <laughs> anyway, um, okay. So talking to the FDA is not going to work. Let's go to the courts. So ACLA hired Larry Tribe and Paul Clement for legal advice. We tried to get some other high-powered attorneys, but these were the, the, the ones that were available that weren't in conflict. And, and they're a great team, and they say, hey, the, the law doesn't mention LTDs or clinical labs explicitly. The law's been unenforced for 39 years. We can win it. Now, they're convinced they can win it. But there's other people that are a little less biased, say, 50-50. Uh, and, of course, people that are all way on the other side say there's less than a 10% chance you'll win this. So it's risky. Let's give the odds at 50-50. Are we going to bet the future of lab medicine on a 50-50 flip of the coin? That's hard to do. Uh, there's two ways to win. One is that it's medical services. The other way is that it's a guidance. If, if they were really following the Administrative Procedures Act the way they should be, they should have introduced a rule. And rules are treated much different than guidances. For one thing, rules don't have this quote in them. Quote, FDA's guidance documents, including this guidance, do not establish legally enforceable responsibilities. 
well, I guess we could just go home and say, oh, well, yeah, you can finalize your guidance. We'll just ignore it. <laughs> That's what that says, right? You can ignore it. It's not legally enforceable. Uh, but trust me, it, it won't work that way. Also, rulemaking uh, needs more time for review and feedback, and you have to do an economic impact uh, analysis if you're the government entity. So you have to figure out how much it's going to cost. FDA doesn't even know how many lab-developed tests there are. They know how many CLIA labs there are, but they don't know how many LTDs are out there. So um, how could they possibly uh, know the economic impact of it? Okay. Uh, option two is go work with the office and management and budget. I like to call this the delaying tactic. As I mentioned before, they review all regulations and guidances. They have the power to delay. They can delay things. They can't stop them completely. I thought that they could delay it forever, but uh, we only got four years of delay out of them. But if the final guidance comes to them, and it will have to come to them, when it does, we will be lobbying them heavily to, for another four-year delay. So we can at least keep pushing this down the road. Okay, we finally get to the last option, which is the most concrete. Let's pass a law. So in 2013, I donated money to this uh, uh, Republican representative from Texas who happens to be an obstetrician, but who has some really strange ideas about obstetrical care, let me tell you. <laughs> As I tell people, I have given money to people that I would never vote for, and I'm happy to give money to them. <laughs> so he, he proposed a bill uh, that uh, was pretty simple. It was a little writer on a bill that, that lab developed tests are not medical devices. Well, I really like that. <laughs> but this never got out of committee. It never went anywhere. Um, and I had to explain to my wife why I wrote this big check. <laughs> because you can't give your labs money. You have to give your own money. So uh, the House Energy and C uh, Commerce Committee is working right now on something they call the 21st Century Cures Act. They've sent it up to the Senate. It's huge. They were saving a section of it for uh, FDA CLIA uh, improvement. And uh, uh, they sent the bill up without it, but they're going to try to get it attached as the Senate wrestles with this new act. And the act has a lot of interesting things in it, more money for NIH and uh, precision medicine, a whole bunch of, of, I think, really good things. Uh, but maybe it would be nice to clarify lab-developed tests as well. The Senate uh, uh, Health Committee, which oversees health, is also pursuing their own legislation, and they're very interested in talking uh, uh, with uh, the laboratory industry. And you have a senator who's the ranking member of that committee, uh, Patty Murray, I think is her name. And we have the longest standing senator in the Senate, Orrin Hatch, in fact, he's president pro tem. When I see Orrin now, he's surrounded by Secret Service guys because <laughs> he's in line for the presidency were uh, the other folks to be um, unable to serve for any reason. Anyway, I think I can get Orrin on our side. And the Senate is interesting because they are very much in favor of a CLIA-centric approach, which I've always thought might be a better way to do it. CLIA inspects us now. Well, it's usually CAP as a deemed authority, but it might be better to just be under one regulatory body. And, um, but, you know, CLIA is not perfect either. CMS does some funny things. What they're doing with the clinical lab fee schedule right now is strange. So uh, um, we have these sort of competing proposals. In fact, there's about five proposals on the table right now uh, for... Uh, uh, for looking at, at the FDA oversight of lab developed tests. So I thought it'd be useful to go back and clarify some misquotes that creep into the literature. So the, the quote about laws and sausages uh, wasn't by this auto guy. Uh, I forget his last name now. The one that is, this is attributed to. It's actually uh, was first crafted and written by an American poet, John Gottfried Sachs. And he said, laws like sausages cease to inspire respect in proportion as we know how they are made. Now, for the last year, I have been embedded in a group that's been trying to create a law. And 
I believe this in my very heart. You wouldn't believe how difficult and awkward and, you know, we're laboratorians, we're data-driven, we're logical. There's nothing about creating laws <laughs> that are any of those things. Uh, by the way, there's the original site, University Chronicle, University of Michigan, March 1869. Okay. Um, so uh, I talked a little bit about being embedded in a group. So in February of 2015, we joined formally this Diagnostic Test Working Group, the DTWG. We joined it because we wanted a seat at the table. Kurt Hansen from Mayo came and asked me to join. I spent a week thinking this is a bad idea. And then as I thought more about it and talked to my execs at ARUP, I, we decided that we have to have a seat at the table. If you're not at the table, somebody else is gonna be deciding what law regulates you. So we joined, this was a group that was started by Mayo, Quest, and LabCorp, uh, Roche, BD, and Abbott. And then they invited new members to join. So Myriad Genetics and ARUP joined on the lab side. Quest dropped out for a while, but then they're back. And then Siemens and Cepheid came in. And so uh, we have been working very hard on a proposal uh, to give to Congress, in fact, especially with the House Energy and Commerce Committee. We've had numerous meetings. We have meetings, phone meetings every week and then every other week back in DC. And we have been able to sit down with the FDA for hundreds of hours going through what the proposals are, going through their draft guidance and telling them why it won't work and, and how it should be morphed if, if it could work. And the guiding principles for the DTWG is that in vitro clinical tests are not medical devices. That's in the proposal. The second thing is that the type and level of regulation should be based on the activity performed, not who performs it. Now that's dicey because it actually opens the door for the FDA. So medical device standard of safe and effective is replaced, you throw the safe and effective away. Is it analytically and clinically valid? Does it measure what we think it measures? And does that measurement somehow correlate with a clinical situation. The next thing we think is needed is a new center. Now, the DTWG thinks that center should be at the FDA. Maybe it should be at CMS, but a whole new center. Don't use the people you've been using. Establish a whole new center. The third thing, which I really like, because I'm getting older, I think about these things. All the current lab developed tests are grandfathered. What you're doing now, you can continue to do. You don't have to submit. Now, if you modify it, you might have to submit if you change its intended use. Okay, we are backing the TTWG because it prevents FDA from finally finalizing their guidance. As long as we're talking, they won't issue a final guidance. And the final guidance would be that worst case outcome because then we're in a 50-50 lawsuit with them. We do have support of the House Energy and Commerce Committee on the DTWG. They're gonna come out with language this week or next week, I don't know. You can't tell about Congress. They give you one date and then they just change it. They have something going on with a Speaker of the House this week <laughs> that, uh, anyways, <laughs> yeah. All right. I have concerns about our own proposal, even though I've been helping craft it. Uh, the biggest concern I have is that the FDA regulates it and I'm really not sure that I can trust the FDA to regulate it wisely and, and uh, in, in the benefit of, of, uh, of patients. Uh, there's no guarantee, even though we've changed how they should look at submissions, that they actually will, and that they'll be able to more rapidly turn them around. We've tried to craft the proposal with really hard deadlines, and if they don't meet a deadline, they can't reject it and say, start over. They have to tacitly approve it if they don't meet the deadline. Uh, the benefit of all of this new law and regulation, I don't think it's been proven that will actually help patients. Will all this change really benefit patients? Will keeping a few bad fraudsters off the market, which this will do, is, is that enough to spend all this time and resource and money on the good tests that we're all performing? So the costs will be higher, and the costs are difficult to estimate. I've been trying to take my current estimations of, of 5, 10 Ks and PMAs and imagine what they'll be for class two and three um, uh, tests in the future, and it's, it's hard to do. 
uh, without experimenting and finding out what it might cost. Also, backing the DTWG means opposing the AMA and the Association of Molecular Pathology and CAP because those groups want a CLIA solution. The Senate committee is very receptive to a CLIA solution, but the House is not. Uh, finally, one of my concerns is that the, uh, the proposal that we're putting forth doesn't address new intended uses. We've always been searching for a new use of an old test, and, and we find these things all the time. It's amazing how much uh, new discoveries in medicine revitalize an old test that you thought was uh, not as useful. And uh, this proposal requires submissions in those cases if, if the test is moderate or high risk. So those are my concerns. Uh, but on the other side, it is a proposal that's been very detailed in its approach, and it's the only one where the manufacturers and the labs and the FDA have all sat down to talk about. So at least all the parties are talking about it, and I think the more we talk, maybe the more we'll get uh, some middle ground. I mean, if, the, if supporting the DTWG allows us to, in two or three years, get a middle ground that is affordable and um, perhaps has some benefit for patients, then it's a good thing to do. Those of you interested about this, I'll be giving the white paper out by email if you wish it. We're, we're free to distribute it now. It's been under wraps until now. But last Friday, we voted as a working group to release the second version of the white paper. We just need your feedback. Read it and try to give me your critique of it. I've been embedded in the process, and when you're embedded in any process, you end up with some biases. I mean, I'd like to see uh, our, our work come to fruition, but uh, it does take a whole village to do. So here's the action that we need to do. How many LTDs do you have? Build a database. Do you have any? Let's, let's ask Dr. Astin. Got any LTDs at Children's Hospital? Well, we do, but I don't think we have a database yet. Oh, no, yeah. No volunteers to do it. No volunteers to do it. You know, it takes somebody. So Maria Raleigh built our database for us at ARUP, and in, in her cube, she put up a sign, do not disturb me, I'm building a database. And that hung on her cube for about four months. It's, it's hard. It is really hard because, you know, you got to decide test by test. It's a lab-developed test. You buy an FDA reagent. Is it off-label? It's, it's not easy. And then not only do you want to build it, but you want to classify them. Is it low, medium, or high? It takes a lot of work. But it would be useful because you, it would help you know what submissions you need to start with first. Uh, submit your comments on the DTWG uh, or, or talk to me about it once you have a chance to read it. Consider the other proposals. You know, uh, uh, I fly out Sunday to, D to Washington, D.C., not to meet with the FDA, but to meet with the AMA, because the AMA is currently looking at all five proposals on the table and trying to find the common elements in each to see if there could be agreement and some middle ground. I don't think we should live with a guidance. I think if we have to move forward and it looks to me politically like we have to, then it should be legislation. It should be a new law. Even though we don't want to eat the sausage, I think we need to eat the sausage. And then finally, if the FDA does come out with a guidance, I'll be out hat in hand asking for some money to help pay these expensive lawyers. Larry Tribe gets $1,000 an hour and Clement gets 900 And they have a whole cadre of people that work for them. So it's going to be a multi-million dollar lawsuit and we'll need help. And that, oh my goodness, I've gone five minutes over. I'm glad I didn't show my four-minute thing.